My favorite moment of 2020 was when we met Chicken Butt, a man whose head is quite literally the butt of a chicken. Or a rooster, I guess, if you want to get all technical and correct. Doesn't matter. Either way, the question then becomes, how does he poop? Does it come out of his head butt? Or does it escape via the rooster head? Potentially a rooster head butt. All of these questions and more will need answering in 2021. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a difficult yet highly enjoyable task of picking out our best moments of 2020. Not a year that I think think we generally want to celebrate or remember because it's being quite awful in almost every area possible. However, there is at least one exception to that, and that is the ever sturdy One Piece. Because despite the fact that manga production was significantly impacted by a certain pandemic, 2020 has been a pretty ridiculously stacked year for One Piece. So much so that I usually make a top 10 list for this sort of traditional occasion. However, that simply does not work this time. And I do think it needs to be a top 15 because there are far too many moments worthy of recognition. Now for anime only watch, as I do need to say sorry, but this list is going to consist of events that have occurred in the manga, none of which have been animated yet. So I guess just be aware that this is basically a list of 15 massive spoilers for you. And just to recap, the chapters we received in 2020 consist of everything from chapter 967 entitled Roger's Adventure, all the way to chapter 999, the sake I brewed to drink with you. Chapter 1000 is not officially out and therefore not eligible. And before we do the, the, the thing it is that we do, this is your final opportunity of 2020 to subscribe to the Grand Line Review in order to receive regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. And yeah, I suppose you could do it in 2021, but why procrastinate? Do it now and let's just end the year in style. Vibrant, red, glorious style. But let's head into this adventure that is 2020 with number 15, Onigashima Floats. A very recent event that comes to us courtesy of chapter 997, but this panel was quite literally breathtaking. I mean it. I stopped breathing when I saw this for the first time, just out of pure shock, because this situation is absurd in all of the best ways. This grand action accomplished so much, giving us our urgent one calamity and raising the dramatic stakes, as well as emphasizing the pure power of Mr. Kaido and what we're up against in this arc. And after 20 plus years of high stakes drama, this is another situation that we haven't been in before, and I can do nothing but applaud Oda for continuing to find creative apocalyptic style scenarios. Moving along though, in number 14, we have the betrayal of Mr. Conjuro. So this happened much earlier in the year, and it might even be a distant memory now, but this was a definite highlight for me, this time in all of the worst possible ways though, because it made me despise a character who I previously quite enjoyed. To be fair though, in exchange for that, it made Conjuro infinitely more fascinating, and there's a lot of great stuff to explore with him in retrospect, now. Like the idea that he was drawing poorly on purpose using his non-dominant hand, as well as the fact that he is a stereotypical kabuki actor. So it makes all the sense in the world that he was the one pretending to be a vassal. Acting if you will. And also, as far as we're aware, Kondro died off screen or off stage, which is a great insult to an actor to rob them of that dramatic culmination. But you know what, Kondro? You are a dick, so you can deal with it. To number 13 now, we have caught a big fish because this will be the return of Jinbei. Another one of those moments that feels like it happened a lifetime ago, but one of the more monumentally important things to have happened in 2020. Although I will admit, as I did in the chapter review, it was a bit weird. Jinbei just sort of appeared out of nowhere in the exact right place at the exact right time, which spawns questions, ever so many questions. I guess all of which are irrelevant right now because I am just happy to have him back. And Jinbei has been a phenomenal addition to the Wano arc. And of course, I very much look forward to seeing him in action next year. And in order to do that, one of Jinbei's potential opponents makes up our number 12, which is going to be the introduction of the Toby Ropo. Or I guess the members of the Toby Ropo that we did not already know about, which consists of all of the fun ones, such as Ulti, Black Maria, and Who's Who. I never expected to like these guys anywhere near as much as I do now, because it's always a big risk to introduce this sort of glob of characters. For example, a glob of characters that I don't really like all that much would be the numbers, because... Who cares about the numbers? But the Toby Ropo very much each made their mark on me, with my favorite, of course, being Ulti. And do please leave a comment in the comment section below, which is for comments, outlining who your favorite member of the Toby Ropo is. Just be aware though, that if it isn't Ulti, you are wrong. And just as a bit of a sub moment here, the revelation of all of their devil fruits was also nothing short of amazing, especially who's who, because he's a big old kitty cat. And just, yeah, look for characters who we only met this year. They have no right whatsoever to be anywhere near as cool as they are. Which 
Which leads us conveniently into number 11. One might even say this was planned, scripted perhaps. But our 11th place finisher is the introduction of Yamato, which was one of the nicest surprises for me this year. And the very existence of Yamato is something that I don't think we'll even be able to fully appreciate until after Wano and possibly even into the final saga. Because what Yamato potentially represents is the answer to some of the greatest lingering mysteries in the series. You see, Yamato has access to very special bits of paper holding the written accounts of Kozuki Odin arranged in a chronological order also known as a journal. But crazily enough, there is every chance that Yamato knows just about everything that we want to know. The Will of D, Laugh Tale, Road Poneglyphs, Joy Boy, The Void Century, The Dawn of the World, whatever Odin chose to log. It's all right here in this character who is also a startlingly strong contender to become a straw hat as well. So it's very difficult not to appreciate Yamato. To something of pure shock value now, the number 10 greatest moment of the year would be the death of Orochi. And you probably can't hear this from my voice alone, but I did put the word death in quotation marks because I'm still not so sure about this one myself. But with what we have to work with, we have one hell of a death scene. Kaido unceremoniously slicing Orochi's head off is the sort of visually depicted brutality that I don't generally expect from One Piece. And there's a nice little detail in the panel where we see King in the background offering Kaido the use of his sword. Meaning that this whole thing was either set up well in advance or that King just knows Kaido well enough to know when his captain needs to slice a fool. Either way, if nothing else was accomplished with this, I did enjoy seeing the Kaido King dynamic. Meanwhile, in number nine, we head to Bird Town or Bird Town heads to us because we have the arrival of Marco the Phoenix. Of all of the game changes on Wano, Marco is probably the most important and together with Izo, he represents a whole different side of this Kozuki Odin inherited will equation. It did and does still bother me somewhat just how passive the Whitebeard Pirates were even after finding out about Odin's death. So I'm glad that they're being represented here by a figure who I suppose would still be the de facto leader. Also, he was shown eating a pineapple this year, which if I'm not mistaken, is our second instance of cannibalism in One Piece. For number eight, we can't go past one of my favorite quotes of the year, which is, when you're at sea, you fight against pirates. This was the moment that very much kickstarted the year for me because the year actually began mid Odin flashback and so we were caught in quite a uh, depressing state of affairs. However, the simultaneous arrival of Luffy, Kid and Law is exactly what we needed to signal the beginning of a counterattack, as well as the beginning of a shift in tone to a more hopeful prospect. Plus, I just love this series of three panels. I want a giant high quality version hanging on my wall somewhere. And I've actually been telling myself that since March and I, well, I still haven't done it. So maybe, maybe I should go and do that now. Or not, because we do have a lot of gold left to go through, including that one time where Zoro annihilated Scratch Manapu. Chapter 997 it was, which was probably one of the best chapters of the year. But Zoro getting annoyed at all the shenaniganry going on around him and just deciding to slice open his second member of the worst generation was simply stunning. The composition, the texture, the shading, the timing, everything is perfect, but the chef's kiss comes directly afterwards, where the antidote to the uh, the ice demon thing just gets flung up in the air or like, and Zoro just catches it without even looking because F you queen. We're not playing your stupid games anymore. Meanwhile, number six is going to be a significantly more subtle event, but it is the revelation of Kaido's devil fruit. Something which we got in right at the end with chapter 999, which immediately destroyed all accepted thought within the fan base of a dragon fruit or an ogre fruit, all in one casual line. Because as it turns out, Kaido is a fishy. A pretty damn magical fish, but still a fish nonetheless. And as with most things in One Piece, it looks so damn obvious in retrospect, given that to even get into Wano, we had to ride up a waterfall filled with all sorts of koi, which was a legend that the fish fish fruit is potentially based on. And whilst we still don't have an official name for it with the model and everything, it was still a landmark event nonetheless. Just as with each and every one of our top five moments, which begins with the straw hats fully assembled. And this might seem like a slightly underwhelming thing at first, but seeing a shot of the entire crew ready for action is not something that has happened since long ago in the days of Fishman Island. The last time these 10 characters were in a single panel ready to fight was one published in 2011. So it has been a very, very long time filled with all sorts of crew absences. But finally, now in 2020, we have again our full crew and that simplistic magnificence is kind of it. On a more somber note though, we do have number four in which we need to travel back in time to visit the death of Kozuki Odin. And I have to say this whole flashback was pretty damn lit and unfortunately, Unfortunately, so was the pot that Odin was standing in during his execution. Also, something stupidly brilliant is juxtaposing this moment with Odin's introduction. The man is introduced eating a pot of Odin on the burning corpse of a friend. And his final moments involved him dying in a pot of Odin to save his friend, so there's a nice bookend effect happening here. But this instantly became one of the most memorable death scenes in One Piece, with Odin doing the impossible and lifting all of his vassals in order to save them from his fate. And just the words, my name is Odin and I was born to boil are so ingrained in my mind. 
Especially because the crowd finished the line after Kaido shot Odin. It's so tragic, but so damn good. And this whole event very much strengthens and informs our number three spot, which is the Vassals versus Kaido. This conflict was pretty astounding. With the Vassals throwing epic surprises at us during every turn of combat, and although it does look like they ultimately failed to bring Kaido down, at the same time, they did fare better than most people could have anticipated. So yes, it may have been a very one-sided affair, but I relished these moments of action and watching our goofy samurai figures step up in the world. I now have a level of respect for each and every one of them that did not exist prior to this event, especially Kinemon. However, there are still two moments that hit me harder, one of which came from a very unexpected source being Nami and her declaration that Luffy would become the Pirate King. This is very much unlike anything else we've discussed so far, which are fairly world shaking reveals or grand action pieces, but this is a moment of the purest subtlety. It's not Nami yelling at the top of her lungs that Luffy will become the King of the Pirates. Instead, she is tearfully embracing her captain's dream, even though it likely means her imminent death at the hands of, or I guess the head of Ulti. It was really touching and I think it's way up there on the list of the greatest Pirate King declarations in the series, of which there are a whole host of other amazing contenders, but this one definitely stands on its own. But this is some Death Tanami that I've been craving ever since the New World Era began and definitely one of the best moments of the year. But when we're talking about the best, there is only one true contender. There is only one moment that was universally adored and bound to be remembered as one of the landmark events of the entire series and that is of course, Frankie Freedom Rider. Look, when the funny robot smashed the other large mother in the face with the motorcycle, the entire world just stood still. In all seriousness though, it's obviously he laughed. Probably quite anticlimactic because I imagine that just about everyone was expecting this, but Roger landing on Laugh Tale and discovering what our mysterious treasure is, is simply a series defining moment. An immediately iconic panel that stands out within a sea of panels contained in 1000 chapters of content. Something quite funny though is that he laughed is from chapter 967, which was the very first chapter to be published in 2020. And I believe that I titled that review chapter of the decade, which is a very audacious claim, but looking back on things, it still absolutely was the chapter of the year. There were definitely other amazing chapters, but nothing stood up to what this initial offering provided. It was a superbly strong beginning to the year, and it's how I'm going to be ending the year. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next year.